This video covers major concepts regarding animal form and function. Specifically, we will look into the animal body plan and its hierarchical organization, exchange with the environment, and an overview of animal tissues and animal coordination and control. An animal's body plan, which is composed of the animal's size and shape, determines how individuals interact with their environment. A body plan is not something animals determine consciously. Instead, this is a result of specific patterns of development controlled by the genome and a result of evolution. But how does the environment help in shaping a body plan? Let's look at the aquatic environment and the fast swimmers, such as tuna and penguins. Water is a denser and more viscous substance when compared to air, making it more difficult for animals to move. However, certain species like tuna can reach swimming speeds up to 50 miles per hour, and they can do so because of their fusiform shape. Convergent evolution is responsible for giving this specific shape to most fast swimmers. In terms of function, all animals must exchange nutrients, waste, and gases with their surrounding environment, and this represents another limitation for body plants. Exchange must occur in an aqueous environment, and through plasma membranes of each cell. Exchange directly depends on two factors, the surface area of a membrane and the body volume of an individual. This represents the surface area to volume ratio, with small unicellular organisms having higher ratios than large individuals. Think of a unicellular organism, such as the amoeba shown in the figure. Because this consists of only one cell, the whole membrane is in direct contact with the aqueous environment, allowing individuals to have direct exchange. However, in larger, more complex organisms, such as the hydra shown in the other figure, the two layers of cells must have direct exchange with the environment. Like this, the more cells in a body plant, the more complex the change becomes. In highly complex animals, like humans and other mammals, there are specialized surfaces for exchanging chemicals with their surroundings. Since not all cells are in direct contact with an aqueous environment outside of the organism, animals have adapted to external and internal exchange. Internal exchange depends on internal body fluids, linking an exchange surface with cells. In many animals, the fluid filling up the spaces between cells is known as the interstitial fluid. More complex body plants also have a circulatory fluid that exchanges chemicals with the interstitial fluid. The most common circulatory fluid is the blood, enabling all cells in the body to obtain nutrients and get rid of waste. In many animals, the respiratory, digestive, and excretory systems all have exchange surfaces, whereas the circulatory system carries all chemicals transported across these surfaces. It is clear that complex body plants have a more challenging time in terms of exchange with the environment. However, this complexity brings other advantages such as external skeleton to protect against predation, sensory organs providing more information about the surroundings, digestive organs to break down food, and specialized filtration systems that adjust the composition of internal fluids. As with the hierarchical organization in many other group of organisms, animals have successive levels of a structural and functional organization that goes from cells to organ systems. The idea of hierarchical organization establishes that cells develop into tissues, tissues into organs, and organs into systems. This is often called a bottom-up organization, as shown in the dark boxes. However, if we consider a top-down hierarchy, shown in the green boxes, we can see the multi-layer basis of a specialization. In other words, how organ systems are made up of specialized organs, tissues, and cells. For example, Think about the digestive system and how each organ has a specific role. The stomach's main function, for example, is to break down proteins, which is accomplished by digestive fluids secreted by tissues making up the stomach's walls, and that these fluids are produced by specialized cell types, responsible for secreting digestive enzymes, generating hydrochloric acid and producing mucus to protect the stomach lining. Let's look at the specific tissues found in animals. As mentioned before, organ systems are formed from specific cells and tissue types. In animals, we can describe four main types of tissue, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. The epithelial tissue covers the outside of the body and the lining of organs in the body. The main function of this tissue is to serve as a protective barrier from mechanical injury, pathogens, and fluid loss. 
the epithelial tissue is made up from different cells arranged in specific patterns depending on the location and function they serve in the body. We can then describe five major epithelia, the stratified squamous, found as the outer skin and linings of the mouth, the pseudostratified columnar that lines the respiratory tract and sweet mucous films, the simple squamous, functioning in the exchange of materials by diffusion and it is found lining blood vessels and air sacs, the simple columnar found in the intestines and serving in secretion and absorption, and the cuboidal, making up kidney tubules and many glands such as the thyroid. The second type of tissue is the connective. As with the epithelial tissue, there are five specific subtypes of connective tissue. First is the loose connective tissue, the most widespread in animals holding, on, holding organs in place. The blood is actually a tissue responsible for carrying oxygen and defending against pathogens using white blood cells. Next, we have cartilage, made of collagenous fibers that act as cushions in bones. Then we have adipose tissue, which serves as a storage for fat and insulation. We have bone tissue, making up the skeleton of animals. And finally, we have fibrous connective tissue, which is found in tendons and ligaments. The third type of tissue is muscle tissue, which in general are fibers that contain actin and myosin and are responsible for movement. The first subtype is a skeletal muscle responsible for voluntary movements. The second is the smooth muscle, found in the digestive and urinary tracts, arteries, and other organs that are controlled by involuntary movement. And finally, the cardiac muscle, which forms the contractile wall of the heart. The last type of tissue is the nervous, including neurons, nerve cells, and glial cells. Neurons and other nerve cells receive and transmit impulses to other cells whereas glial cells help nourish, insulate, and replenish neurons. Now, having looked at animal form and some types of function, we need to discuss coordination and control. For this, the body relies on two major systems, the endocrine and the nervous systems. First, let's look at signaling by hormones. This is one of the ways in which the endocrine system works, and a stimulus is necessary to activate an endocrine cell which will then secrete hormones. Hormones are chemical compounds that act as signaling molecules. Hormones travel through the blood and reach receptors on specialized cells that trigger a response. Signaling by neurons is another type of coordination and control. Here, a stimulus is received by a neuron, which will then initiate an action potential or nerve impulse that travel along the axon and the axon terminals to reach another neuron or a different types of cell. The receiving cell is the one that triggers a response. I hope you found this video really helpful. The concepts and information presented in this video will be true no matter what biology class you are taking. However, the concepts presented in this video are referencing material currently covered in Baylor University's coursework. Images and diagrams are from Campbell's Biology 11th edition unless otherwise stated. Remember, if you are a currently enrolled Baylor student, we offer free tutoring services in our tutoring center, which is located on the first floor of the Sid Richardson building. You will find all of the details you need to know about these services in our website, which is www.baylor.edu forward slash tutoring. You can schedule a free 30-minute one-on-one tutoring session online or just drop in during any of our business hours. For many information about our current services, please visit our website. Thank you.